If I were to go around and ask you, does anybody here have a necklace that they're wearing? Or a ring? Or a piece of jewelry? Or something very precious that a family member gave to them? Think of that right now. Does anybody want to volunteer an answer? Let's see a show of hands on this side of the church. Does anybody have something here that, uh, yes? Uh, does somebody want to volunteer an answer? Yes. What do you have there? And who gave that to you? Did somebody in your family give it to you? A dear friend made that necklace, and now you wear that. And is that dear friend still walking among us on earth, or has that person passed on to, to God? The person is... Very nice. Does anybody else have another item? Maybe perhaps somebody that has passed away. Monica? A necklace that your father gave you. And is your father with us, or has, he is not? He has gone on to God. And what is that necklace that you're wearing? Amethyst. So the necklaces that both of you are wearing have very special meaning. And the rest of you here have some type of object, perhaps, that you have given uh, a family member or a child or a good friend. And whenever we talk about that necklace that you're wearing, whether it's by Mrs. Balagat or Monica, we in some way remember that person, don't we? Do not we, don't we recall that person somehow at this moment? Do we not make present in a, in a certain sense that person's memory? Now, what if I were to take that object and just totally leave it in a drawer? If I were to leave it in my car's glove compartment? In a way, and over the years, over time, I would forget about it, wouldn't I? Well, the same thing is true in the spiritual life, because if, 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 I, if you can think of a dear friend of yours or a family member that has, has, has gone on before us or is still with us, and when they say to you, whenever you use this, you are going to recall me. And that's what today's gospel is. Jesus takes ordinary bread and ordinary wine and he changes it. He changes the substance of bread and wine into his body and blood. His real, true presence, body and blood, soul and divinity, the risen Jesus. His Holiness Pope Benedict XVI said, if Jesus did not give us the Eucharist, we would forget what he did with his passion. We would forget the cross. It would just fade off into history. All we would have is a book. All we would have is a book. And we all know how that turned out. 40,000 different denominations because they all can't interpret the Bible. But the one Catholic church has preserved the same Mass that Jesus celebrated at Holy Thursday night. He said, take this, eat it, this is my body. And whenever you eat my body, you remember me, just like the necklaces. So Jesus leaves us not just necklaces that we wear around our neck, but his body and blood throughout time that we receive. And this is important because as we celebrate this National Eucharistic Revival, we are called to re-enkindle in our hearts our belief in the real presence of Jesus. Jesus didn't say, this is a symbol of my body. He said, this is my body. Prestet fides supplementum. Prestet fides supplementum. Fides supplementum. Faith supplies is the translation of that. Sensum defectui. 
where the senses fail. Faith supplies whenever our senses fail to grasp the mystery of Holy Mass. What looks like bread, but isn't bread. What smells like bread, but is not bread. What tastes like bread, but is not bread. And sounds like bread, but is not bread. All these senses of ours do not grasp the mystery that our faith will supply. That it is no longer bread. When the Holy Spirit comes down upon the gifts of bread and wine in the epiclesis, and the priest says, this is my body. The bread transubstantiates into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It is no longer bread. Only the accidents of bread remain. Under the forms of bread and wine remain. The bread does not coexist with the body of Jesus. That's consubstantiation. We do not believe in consubstantiation. We believe in transubstantiation. We believe that it is truly his body and blood, the same risen Jesus that rose from the dead. And as we heard from the first reading today, where Moses would sprinkle blood on the people, we also hear the story in the book of Genesis, how God prepares us for the Eucharist. And he prepares us for the Eucharist because our first parents committed the first disobedient act in original sin. And how did they do this? God told them, you shall not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what did they do? They ate like a little, like, like a little four-year-old kid. When you tell them, don't touch that, don't put the key in the electrical socket, you're going to get electrocuted. What do they do? They're going to put the key in the electrical socket. Kids, don't do that at home. What did our first parents do, Adam and Eve? They committed the first original sin from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The very act that condemned the human race, eating from the the forbidden fruit, is the same act that is going to save the human race. Eating. But it is eating the body and blood of Jesus Christ. How wondrous a mystery that God redeems the world. And throughout the Old Testament, God prepares from the time of Adam and Eve to the time of Jesus Christ. There's a pious legend that says that the chalice that Jesus used at the Last Supper was mysteriously also present in Noah's Ark. And then over time, that chalice ended up on Holy Thursday when Jesus celebrated Mass for him to use. And then the people of God in in Egypt, they would put blood over their doorposts to preserve them from the angel of death which would pass over them. And do we not, when we receive Holy Communion, put the blood of the Lamb over our hearts to save us so that the angel of death passes over us? And then the people wandered in the desert and God gave them manna from heaven. And then they carried the manna from heaven and the Ten Commandments in a box called a tabernacle. And that tabernacle had two statues of an angel here and an angel there. The angels, the statues would flank the Ark of the Covenant. And do we not today have the new Ark of the Covenant, Mary, who carried Jesus in her womb? And the people of God in Israel wanted to put the tabernacle in a house so that they built a temple in Jerusalem. And that temple in Jerusalem, they put the Ark of the Covenant, they put the tabernacle. But that temple was destroyed. And the prophet said, Jesus Christ is going to be born of a virgin. And do we not prepare? Like it is written in the book of Daniel, which is the last book of the Old Testament. Where the angels, where Daniel has a vision, the prophet Daniel has a vision. And the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy. And do not our guardian angels, your guardian angels, at mass come and bow down before Jesus when the priest consecrates bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So throughout the, all of the Old Testament, God prepares us for this mystery of his body and blood. 
he said, I will not leave you orphans. And how does he do that? He does that by giving us the sacrament of his body and blood, his real presence. And then when God took flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary at the Annunciation, she became pregnant with Jesus. Do we not, when we receive Holy Communion, reflect the image of Mary, the mother of Jesus, when we receive Jesus on our tongues and to our tummies and into our hearts. And then Jesus, at the wedding feast of Cana, at the behest of his mother, changed water into wine, a prefigurement of changing wine into his, bo- into his blood. And then Jesus feeds the 5,000, a true miracle, out of the little loaves and fish that we have. And do we not have in our own lives our own little loaves and fish that we give to Jesus? This foreshadows, as the Catechism says, a superabundance of the Eucharist, where Jesus is going to feed the flock. And then, as we heard from the Gospel today, do we not hear the story of Jesus saying, This is my body. Jesus will not give us an impossible command. If Jesus were to say, this microphone is a piece of paper, I will say, amen, it is a piece of paper. If Jesus were to say, this napkin is a pencil, I will say, amen. If Jesus were to say, that necklace is a thousand million dollars, I will say, amen. And so if Jesus says, this bread is my body, I will say, amen. It's not just a mere symbol, as over 60% of Catholics believe today, according to some studies. And we hear this also in today's second reading, in the letter to the Hebrews, where the author of Hebrews says, if the old people were justified by animals and the blood of goats and bulls, how much more are we justified by the Lamb of God? And Jesus said in today's gospel, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine until I drink it with you in the kingdom of heaven. And the tradition of the church is that this is going to be at the eschaton. It'll be at the end of the world where we will have after the judgment, the final judgment, we will have our moment with our resurrected body with Jesus. And Jesus will celebrate that divine liturgy in heaven. The Holy Mass is a foreshadow of heaven. It's a little bit of heaven on earth. And then when Jesus comes again at his second coming, that will be, according to some Catholic commentators, the last Mass that we'll celebrate. So throughout all of history, brothers and sisters, the Holy Eucharist becomes our food. And this is important, especially for those of us who... It's difficult for us to go to Mass every Sunday sometimes, don't you think? And for you early birds, for us early birds, we have to get up early in the morning. But that's the sacrifice we make. Because when we love somebody, we will do what they say. And Jesus says to us, take this and eat it. This is my body. As often as you eat it and drink it, you proclaim my death, you remember me. In closing, dear brothers and sisters, I like to always quote the mystics every now and then. This is private revelation, so you're not bound to believe this. It is approved by the church. And in this private revelation, Blessed Anne Catherine had that vision of Jesus dying for you. It's his love that dies for you and me. That's great that we're talking about increasing our faith. That's great, I just help you increase your hope. But it is a noisy gong if the word of God does not move us to love him in return. Love, his love, is returned by your love. So yes, we may understand it up here and hear it here in the homily. But may it go here, just like your dear friend, just like your dad. Take this, all of you, 
eat it. This is my body. This is my blood. I shall not drink of this cup until I drink it with you anew in the kingdom of God.